My name is Tina Camp. For those of you who haven't met me, I am the director of the Barnard Center for Research on Women. Um, it is my great pleasure and thrill to be hosting this, which is the second in a series of events across the country, um, uh, on focused on racial profiling, police violence, and criminalization, seen through the perspective of women of color, girls, trans, and gender non-conforming non uh, people of color. So BCRW is really, really honored to be able to host this, and I need to actually recognize Andrea Ritchie for all of the work that she's done to put this together. Please join me in thanking her. As I did yesterday, I'm also going to begin by acknowledging the original inhabitants of this land, the Lenape people, and the genocide and land theft that has enabled our presence here today, as well as the enslaved African people who built so much of this city, and those who are excluded from this space by borders of nation accessibility, or based on disability, income, or other factors. Well, I'm going to begin by asking our panelists for the first panel to come forward, um, and our moderator will introduce them, and we'll, be, we'll just kick off into our first uh, conversation. Good morning. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming out today. It's beautiful to see you. Um, it is chilly, but with all of the warm energy in the room, I'm sure we're going to warm it up, we're going to heat it up, we're going to get fired up. Um, the conversation is going to be rich, it's going to be engaging, it's going to be interactive. We have an amazing panel, but all of you are as amazing as well. So I'm hoping that in our short time this morning, we're able to really launch the day with a rigorous conversation that gives us a lot of information, but also like inspires us to action. Does that sound good? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, my name is Monifa Bandele. I'm a vice president at an organization called Moms Rising. Um, we work across many issues that impact women and mothers, and one of them is mass incarceration. Um, as you know, there are about one million women that are under some form of criminal justice supervision in this country, which translates to about 220,000 that are actually behind bars, which translates to about 2.7 million children who have an incarcerated parent. So this is a big issue for all communities, but as we'll find out when we think about intersectionality and in which communities are impacted the most, there are some that are in extreme risk and on extreme margins. So we're gonna start with a film. And I think what we'll do is show that clip and then I'll come back and I'll introduce all of the folks on the panel. Hello, everybody. I am so sorry to miss this important conference on Invisible No More. I wish I could be there. I wish I could be with all of you. I'm sure the spirit is wonderful there and I could use some of it myself. Uh, Unfortunately, I have a scheduling conflict I couldn't get out of, but I'm so happy that I can join you electronically and virtually at least, and my heart and spirit are with you. I want to just say a little bit uh, about the policing of Black motherhood and how it intersects with the child welfare system in particular. There's so many ways in which black mothers are policed in the United States. Every institution contributes to it, whether we're talking about the prison system, police, foster care system, the public assistance or welfare system, education system. You know, you can think in every single one of these systems that they operate in a way to monitor and police and punish Black mothers and to value Black mothers. And this is part of a long history of institutionalized racism and white supremacy and patriarchy in America. I, I don't have time to go into that long history, but if you think about it, you can see how the very origins of slavery in the United States were so invested in policing Black mothers. But one aspect of policing Black mothers that often gets overlooked is the child welfare system. It's amazing that it gets so little attention because it's such a powerful system. It's a system where government agents can go into your home and take your children away. 
uh, with very little evidence, actually no adjudication at the time. And it devastates hundreds of thousands of families and it's targeted at black mothers, especially. Also indigenous mothers are uh, injured by this system and have their children removed at very high rates. Um, I'm gonna focus on black mothers who are also targeted by this system. And I think many people still believe that it's a system that is there to help children. Uh, it claims to be that, but in fact, it operates in a way that punishes mothers by removing their children on allegations that they've improperly taken care of their children. And it's a way for the government to put the blame for structural injustices that do disadvantage Black children in this country and blame their mothers for them. That operates in a, such a powerful way that many people don't even see how it's working and go along with this blame of mothers, even people who would see that incarcerating uh, a mother could be wrong, don't understand that putting her children in foster care can inflict a similar kind of injury and also can operate in the same way uh, to regulate black mothers and also ideologically to blame them for the problems that their children experience. So it operates in much the same way as the prison system. It's, you know, these, both of these systems are parallel and they both disproportionately target and punish and police black mothers. If you think about it, uh, black mothers are about a third of the women who are involved in the child welfare system and about that same number of the women involved in uh, the prison system. So it, both systems operate in this parallel way, but they also intersect in many ways. Uh, just if you think about how policing, you know, by police officers intersects with foster care because black mothers are more likely to be policed by law enforcement. They are more likely to come in contact with government agents who can then uh, accuse them of not taking care of their children. In fact, for some of the reasons why they might be targeted by police, those are also reasons that allegedly make them bad mothers and, are, and so their kids can be taken away from them. And very often child protection agents will call in police to remove children. Uh, and so the, the policing by law enforcement and policing by the child welfare system supports each other. Uh, it also supports each other more in a systemic way by both systems promoting these messages of bad mothering uh, and, and pretending that, what, that they're operating to protect somebody when in fact they're operating to punish and to blame black mothers for uh, just about every problem that exists in our society that's actually caused by structural racism and sexism. So uh, it's important to understand both in terms of how the systems operate, but also in terms of on the ground, how these government agents work together to punish black mothers, uh, whether they be police officers or people working for the child welfare system. So I think it's important that first of all, we explain and acknowledge the policing function of the child welfare system. Uh, we understand how it interacts with other systems that are more obviously punitive systems and that we intervene to have an abolitionist approach the same way we should have for the entire carceral state. We need an approach like that for the child welfare system. It needs to be abolished because it is founded in uh, in targeting women of color for punishment by taking their children away from them. And it's also 
founded in this myth that the reason why there's disadvantage in our society, why some people are so much worse off than other people is because their mothers aren't taking good care of them. So uh, we need to abolish the very philosophy on which the child welfare system is based and then move toward abolishing an approach to children's welfare and families' welfare that's based on punishing their mothers. You know, what, what kind of notion of child welfare animates a system that serves, supposedly serves families by inflicting trauma on them? It's, it's, a, it's a pathological way of thinking about child welfare that should be eliminated. It needs to be replaced by a philosophy and uh, an approach and practical resources that support families rather than policing and punishing families. So uh, how do we do that? Um, well, I, I think it's, it's important to have uh, uh, to educate people about what the system actually does and to re help people critically examine what is actually going on so that they can understand the need to abolish this system. I, I have to say it's harder. It's even harder than getting people on board with abolishing prisons <laughs> to get them to think about abolishing foster care. Because again, there's this idea that it's, it, it might do bad things, but at least its purpose is to protect children. Uh, and so it's, it's, there's a need for education on this, critical education. Um, there's also uh, a, a need to recognize that the mothers who are being policed are the ones who should be listened to and uh, be part of organizing to end the system. Uh, and there are many cases around the country where mothers are trying to organize to change the philosophy and the practice of child welfare, but it's very difficult. They have very few resources, they're stigmatized, and their very actions to change are seen as being um, harmful to their children, to not acknowledging that they, that they the women need to change. And so uh, it's difficult to do. And so I think we, we need to be in collaboration with mothers involved in the child welfare system to uh, identify ways of changing it and to organize uh, to abolish it. Uh, those are some very broad ways of thinking about it. And I know the other panelists are going to talk about more specific um, aspects of what I said uh, and means of intervention. Um, but uh, those, are, those are just some ideas, broad ideas I have about the importance of recognizing the role that the child welfare system plays in the policing of mothers and how it intersects with other punitive systems in America. So thank you. I'm sorry I'm going to miss what everyone else has to say, but I hope to catch up soon. And take care. I love you all. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause for Dorothy Roberts. Um, and she's a professor at University of Pennsylvania. And like she said, we have our panelists who are working on the front lines, who are on every level of this, researching it writing about it, authors, journalists, and um, people on the front line with amazing organizations like Bronx Defenders. So I'm going to just introduce us, and then we're going to jump into our conversation. Um, I have Erin Cloud, who's a team leader in family of the Family Defense Project at the Bronx Defenders, and she works on child welfare, broken windows policing. 
Um, we have Dina Ortiz, parent advocate supervisor, also a part of the Family Defense Project at Bronx Defenders. We have Victoria Law, who is a journalist and author of Resistance Behind Bars, The Struggles of Incarcerated Women. And then finally, we have Jean Flavin, um, professor at Fordham University, working on the intersections of healthcare and policing. And so what our panelists are going to start with is exactly what Dorothy ended with which is talking about how are the child welfare systems and the criminal justice systems parallel, how do they intersect, and where can we disrupt that intersection, and where can we disrupt that pipeline and that collaboration that's working to actually destroy families instead of re repairing them. So I want to jump right away to the Bronx Defenders and talk about what they're doing, working with parents, working with communities, and then we'll go over to our, our journalist and professor to engage some more and open it up. So can we start with Erin, talk about um, that parallel systems, where they intersect, and you know, what are you doing to like blow that up? So I work at the Bronx Defenders. We are a holistic public defense office. I am a team leader and also a supervising attorney. So in the capacity of team leader, I work on a holistic team with social workers, um, criminal defense attorneys, civil advocates, civil attorneys that are working in housing court, public benefits, and we work in a whole entire team, and I work with also parent advocates to figure out what is the best way to mitigate the disruption of systems in our clients' lives, right? Because our clients come into this to meet me in a place where it's not just a family issue, it's not just a criminal issue, it's not just an immigration issue. So how do we disrupt that? When we're looking at the parallels between the criminal justice system and the child welfare system, I can say quite pointedly what is parallel about them is that they are abusive, they are violent, they are designed to break down black and brown people, to break down poor people. What is different about them is that they tend to track different genders. The child welfare system really has deep, dirty, disgusting roots in sexism and patriarchy that is blown up by the war on drugs and centering bad mothering in that notion. And a lot of times we don't think about it that way. We spend a lot of time thinking about what the war on drugs did in the criminal justice system. But we don't spend that time thinking what it did in the child welfare system. If you think about what a crack whore is, a crack baby is, a welfare queen is, all of those people are women. What we know is that in the child welfare system, we have very gendered approaches to what happens to women. They lose their children. We have gendered approaches as to what happens to men. Fathers are excluded. That is the answer to child welfare and safety. Exclude a father, punish the woman, take their child, and then police them, surveil them for years and years and years. Where they intersect the criminal justice system and the child welfare system is that very clearly an arrest can lead to a call that gets child welfare involved. That is a very clear intersection. When a, a person is arrested for any level of crimes, the police officers often, for our community, will call child welfare. And we've actually seen cases where our clients have deemed to abandon their children simply by mere arrest because they haven't had a plan for their kids when they're arrested. So you can imagine the repercussive effect of that. If you, if you acknowledge that broken, that broken windows policing is problematic and it does this dragnet policing force through communities, you can imagine that if you're more likely to have contact with police, and now we're looking and seeing numbers and we're seeing how black women are having way more contact with police in the last 10, 15 years, you can see that that is a very direct correlation, right? They're gonna make that phone call. But what I ask today is for us also to reconsider what policing is. Policing isn't just the police force. Policing 
is state-sanctioned interference in people's lives. Mm -hmm. Policing is state-sanctioned violence to go in a woman's body to take their child, to take their blood, to take their urine, to use their own body against them to prosecute them. I ask you to reimagine that a drug test at birth is something that is helpful for a child. I ask you to think about you, legs spread open in a hospital, having given birth, or your body cut open with a baby coming out of you, and someone dragging another part of your body out, testing it without asking you, and then using it to keep you under surveillance for years. That's violent. That's policing. Those notions that underlie the systems of the criminal justice system, they are all, inter they, they are intertwined and the basis. It's racism. It's sexism. That's how they intersect. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to do is, A, get people to see that, to listen to our clients, to hear their stories. And what we try to do is really something that's not that radical. We try to be confidential. The sad part of what our clients have with us that they don't have with other people, they have the ability to have conversations of what's happening with them where I have an ethical obligation not to tell anyone. I may be the only person they can talk about a drug addiction, about an issue with domestic violence, where they have zero fear that I will report them. That's exactly not true. They will almost always fear that because there's so many people in their life that do it. But once I build the trust, that's something that we can actually talk about and have a conversation about. Right. So that's one thing that we do. Unfortunately, it requires them to be involved in the system to get assigned a public defender to have any space of confidentiality. So what, I don't know that's making things better, but that's what we do. And from the parent advocate, uh, team, what are you guys working yeah, on? Yeah, so um, just like Erin, I work as part of the team. I am the supervisor of the parent advocates, and we basically make sure that our clients' rights are protected the same way they are in court, um, outside of court, because if, if you don't understand the way the child protective system works, and I won't use child welfare because they're not there for the welfare of the child, mm -hmm. um, they all of the dirt is done outside of court, and most of the cases and most of their investigations never make it to court. And so when they do not have an attorney assigned to them, there's really nobody there. And if you enter into these rooms where we go, where they're having thousands of meetings with ACS throughout the life of the case, it's literally like a caseworker from ACS, their supervisor, a deputy director, a facilitator, they're all working for the system, and then our client. And so what myself and what um, our staff does is they're able to, we're able to go into these rooms and make sure that our clients' voices are heard and make sure that they are represented properly without having the attorney. Now, if we're in court, then we also assist the attorney that's assigned to the case um, in making sure that they have all of the relevant information, not the information that ACS chooses to report, um, but our clients' lives. We make sure that our clients are viewed as human beings and not just as statistics and not just as black people and not just as brown people or poor people, but as individual human beings. That starts with the language that we use, where ACS is saying mom or dad, or bio mom or bio dad. We're making them use their names. Mrs. Thomas, Mr. Perez. We're making them use their names and call them who they are. So that way, from day one, they start to view them as a human being, just like you and just like myself. However, what's happening is that they're then reporting what they see versus, and what they hear versus what is the actual facts. And, you know, there's so many people that use, and I don't like to say that everybody that uses is addicted, right? But the minute that our clients walk in there and state that they use, which we oftentimes try to keep them from saying, then automatically they're addicted to drugs and they're bad parents and they absolutely have to go into a drug program. Now, I don't know about you, but I know a bunch of parents that use and parent effectively and proficiently, and they do a good job, and they're, they're mem pro uh, great members of the society, they contribute to society, they work, they take care of their family, they take care of you know, the, their communities, but when our clients 
intertwined with these systems, they become bad parents. And because they're using, whether it be marijuana or heroin or whatever, I believe that you can use and you can parent your child if you had the right support. This is not what's being, you know, what is being displayed in the court systems or in the rooms of ACS. And so that what I think I would want you to leave from here with is knowing that, first of all, think about all of the people you know that use drugs, right? And still go on with their lives as if nothing and still pay taxes and still are whatever quote unquote productive members of society and do not have ACS involvement. And then there's our clients that the minute they take a tote of marijuana or the minute they take a bump of coke, all of a sudden they are now bad parents and the threat looms over them for losing their children and losing their entire livelihood, losing their housing, losing their status, if they're, you know, if they're um, citizens but uh, immigrants, losing their freedom. I mean, all of this comes into play whenever, you know, whenever drugs are involved, surely, but absolutely just because of the color of their skin. Absolutely. Thank you both for that work. I just want to pause on Bronx Defenders. Um, and we see an absolute race and class uh, distinction when it comes to the response to drug use and response to drug abuse, right? Um, when we're talking about black and brown people, when we're talking about poor people with drug use, it's criminalized, right? When you're talking about affluent people, when you're talking about white people, it's recreational. Um, when you talk about addiction, um, also a disease criminalized for people who are poor and for people who have means, it's treated like a disease. You know, it becomes a health issue that is managed through um, a health system. So I actually wanted to then turn to Jean, who works on um, these intersections of, of healthcare and policing, to talk some more about those parallel systems and also the differences, depending on race and class, that you'll be treated as you enter into these systems or that you won't even interact with the systems because of who you are and how you look. So it's um, really good to be here this morning and I'm just really, it's an honor to be in the room, to be in the space. Um, so in terms of, so I'm here, yes, in my capacity as a professor of sociology at Fordham University, which is a Catholic university. Um, but I'm also here as uh, a longstanding member of the Board of Directors for National Advocates for Pregnant Women. And we're a small nonprofit that, that um, defends the dignity and rights of all pregnant people, but particularly those whose drug use, mental health, poverty, race, um, makes them particularly vulnerable to criminal, uh, criminal legal, criminal punishment system or Child Protective Services involvement. So a lot of what I'm gonna say, I'm gonna speak as me and I take responsibility for what I say, but I really need to give props to my colleagues at NAPW who have really taken on a lot of this advocacy um, along with our allies elsewhere. Um, so, you know, this idea of child welfare and criminal legal systems parallel, I think a lot of the points that I would make uh, have already been made. I don't want to do anything other than amplify them. Um, I think though that sometimes there is a, overstatement of the ways in which they're separate or, or people operate as others have pointed out that they are somehow separate. Um, and I think particularly in the cases, so just a little bit of background, um, Lynn and I, Lynn Paltrow who is the ED and founder of NAPW, we undertook a study because we were concerned that laws that were designed for other purposes, but particularly those that efforts to recriminalize abortion, women who um, sought or had abortion, were actually being used, had been used, were currently being used against women who sought to continue their pregnancies to term, to have their babies. And again, overwhelmingly, she started this work in the 90s, and then we picked it up again in 2006. We, um, and we were accused, she was accused at the time, and, and continued, people say, no, 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 you know, that from the um, anti-abortion groups, no, we would never punish uh, one, we wouldn't punish a woman who sought an abortion. We would punish the provider. No, we would never punish a woman for being pregnant when continuing her pregnancy term. Of course not. And you, those are just scare tactics. You're making stuff up. So we, undertook, we attempted to document all the occasions where, in fact, this is exactly what happened. Where if it hadn't been for the fact of this person, and in our cases, I'm going to use the language of, of women and person interchangeably, but in point of fact, all of the cases that we've documented to date have been... Um, of pregnant women, people who identify as women. Um, anyway, so um, we documented at the time 413 cases between 1973 and 2005, where if it hadn't been for the fact of their pregnancy, they would not have been subjected to the arrest, to the detention, to the incarceration in a mental hospital. 
so these were not scare tactics. So I could, I'm gonna wrap it up. I'm gonna get to this here in a moment. I realize I'm well into the three minute mark. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, so so the, the thing that I think I bring um, here today is one of the most, of the many disturbing findings of our study. And yes, African American women um, were overwhelmingly overrepresented in our cases, but it was also, we were able to record for a majority of these cases how the how the case, how the person, how the woman came to the attention of the authorities to begin with. For African American women and women of color, it was over half, about half, a little more than half, were reported by a so-called helping professional, often a healthcare provider or a social worker. Okay, whereas white women were more likely, it was more likely to come into the attention of the system incidentally, like there was a fire, firefighters showed up and there was meth on the table. You know, or um, a pregnant woman. I mean, I mean, or, you know, pregnant woman who was pulled over by the police for drunk driving. You know, and it was in, it, it was accompanied, but she was stopped for a different reason. Um, so that was really disturbing. So in the last years, two years, I've been trying to follow up with that and look at the mechanisms. And I'll just kind of um, leave with this. So, so I guess part of what I said in terms of parallel versus intersecting, I think sometimes we pretend that they're more parallel than in fact they are. Um, I think the other piece, and I'll just touch on this, would be also where we act as if, um, you know, when, our, when many of the women we represent are locked up, which makes it very hard to, to participate in your own defense. But, you know, when, when CPS and, the, and DOC and the Department of Corrections can't seem to coordinate getting her to see her kid, you know, you'd think if they could you think yes, <laughs> yes. And I'm always trying to ratchet back my emotional energy a little bit, but um, <laughs> yes, but <laughs> yeah. just the ironies here. So I think the myth <laughs> of, of the myth of these systems <laughs> being truly parallel rather than reinforcing, and the fact that healthcare, helping professionals, that social workers, that nurses. Again, not the majority necessarily, but their own code of ethics bar them from undertaking this action. Um, so I, that's, I think I'll stop there to, to prevent and maybe chime in with some of the other things in terms of what can be done. Um, but I think one of the things is just being aware that this is happening and recognizing that healthcare providers and social workers themselves may not be the font of trust and s source of services that we like to imagine or pretend that they are. Wow, wow, that's an excellent point, thank you. Um, so we're actually gonna keep on that thread. You all are like really connecting nicely to one another because um, one of the things that was really interesting to me about uh, Victoria Law's work is that she has an upcoming book that looks at how a lot of these alternatives to incarceration that I think a lot of us, are, you know, we're mm -hmm. like, yay, internal incarceration actually perpetuate mass incarceration. So like how you talk about like the social worker and people who we, who we would think and programs that we would think are there to help people, that are there to keep people from being incarcerated are actually an end run. Mm -hmm. And as advocates and organizers and, and researchers, we need to really be aware because we can end up promoting something mm -hmm. that looks good on the outside, yes. um, but it is really not good in the long term. Can you talk about yes. that? Yes. So one of the things that we need to remember, as everybody on the panel has said, is that it, the child welfare and the criminal legal system are not parallel. They reinforce each other, so they intersect. Mm -hmm. They weave in and out of each other. And one can definitely lead to the other, uh, especially if you are black, if you are brown, if you are immigrant, if you are poor, if you are any of these, you know, if you are gender nonconforming, trans, lesbian, you know, like any of these things that are considered not white, not affluent, not middle class, um, um, will lead you into the system. So I wanna give two examples of ways in which um, entry into one leads to another. So going back, I think the child is now eight or 10. So going back, like, you know, several years, five to seven years ago, there was a woman in Tennessee, a black woman, whose child was a toddler. And those of you who have been around toddlers know or were here yesterday when there was a very excited toddler. They don't sit still for very long. You know, they like jump off things, they do things. So the child broke, and I forget if it was either his arm or his leg, but she did what any responsible parent does, and she took him to the emergency room. So she takes him to the emergency room, and 
the hospital personnel decide that she must have done something to this child. Why else would he be in the emergency room with a broken limb? So they call child welfare on her. And she, um, child welfare opens up an investigation. She is arrested um, and charged with um, child abuse, child endangerment. Her son is sent to foster care. Eventually, child welfare decides that there actually is no basis for this charge. By the way, she is also hugely pregnant when she is arrested with her second child. So she goes to jail and she is forced to give birth in jail because somebody thought they were being helpful and thought that because a black woman had a child with a broken arm or leg, she must be a danger to her child. So she gives birth shortly after entering jail. Keep in mind that this is in Tennessee, which also does not have any laws against shackling women during childbirth. So she gives birth. She's immediately separated from her child, as is the case for um, people who give birth behind bars across the country. She is returned to the jail. Her newborn is placed also in foster care. So now she's got two kids in the system as child welfare slowly, glacially does their investigation. They eventually conclude that there is no basis for the child abuse allegations. However, the sheriff decides he's going to continue to pursue these charges. So she spent nearly five years behind bars fighting these charges because she again and again was like, I did not do anything to my child. He broke his arm or his leg. I did what any responsible mother would do and I took him to the emergency room. And I should not be punished for this. And because of that phone call, she missed almost five years of her kids' lives, five years of her own life sitting behind bars. She fought this case tooth and nail and she finally won. But it took five years and that was what the intersection of somebody thinking that they were doing good or protecting children or you know looking out for the best interests of the child did to this woman's life and to her family so that is like one way and we don't know how many other times people are charged with this and maybe they plead out maybe um, I want to also add that she had somebody who was able to either pay for a lawyer or pay for bail and so she chose to pay for the lawyer because she said, I need to get rid of this charge that's, always that's going to be hanging over my head. I would rather stay behind bars and miss how no who knows how many years of my baby's lives to make sure that we are free of this. So she was able to do that because somebody had the money to pay for a lawyer. Imagine how, what happens if you don't have the money to pay for a lawyer to get, um, to get free of these charges. And then another example that I want to give happened in New York City. Um, another woman of color was supposed to go to drug treatment. So she, she told me like she had been mandated to go to drug treatment and I think it was the year of the transit strike for any of you people who have been here. Um, and she was not able to get to the drug treatment center in time and she was, um, she, um, the social worker called child welfare. Child welfare showed up, they took her child um, from her because she was not um, complying with the terms of whatever her case was. And she admits that she had a substance use issue, right? You can parent and you can use. She wanted to not be using or child welfare wanted her not to be using, but she always points out that even during the times that she was high, she was there for her child. You know, her child was fed, clothed, bathed, you know, taken care of, you know, and what ended up happening when child welfare took her child away, it's like all bets were off. Why should I bother with anything? And so she would go and she would use, because she was a woman of color, she would get swept up in street bus, she would get arrested, she would go to Rikers Island. Um, she'd be like, I know I have a case coming up. For those of you who know about Rikers Island or dealing with any jail system, it's not like you can just walk over to an office and be like, hey, I think I have a court case. Can you tell me when the court case is? No, you like submit a kite or like a written piece of paper that says, I need to go see my counselor. And depending on the jail system, the counselor may see you the next day, two days from now, three days from now, two weeks from now. And so oftentimes by the time she saw her counselor, the court date had passed. 
And so what ended up happening was she kept showing up to, or she kept not showing up to family court. And nobody bothered to inform the judge that, you know, the, woman, the reason why this woman isn't showing up is because her child, or because she's at Rikers and nobody's telling her mm -hmm. about this. And eventually she lost custody of her child. So these are ways in which you can see the ways in which incarceration and the child welfare system not just run parallel, but they also interconnect. Absolutely. Thank you so much. A couple of the points that were raised definitely make me want to shout out uh, Black Mama's Bailout mm -hmm. campaign. Many yes. of you have heard about that yeah. last year. Um, that's a good question, if it's going to be year-round. I know many organizations that were inspired by that amazing action um, have, have picked that up. The Freedom Fund, you can donate to the Freedom Fund at any point in time you want. It is something that you can give your money to, and what it does is that when people are incarcerated and they have um, bail is set at a certain amount, that we can actually bail people out so they are not in jail just for cash purposes mm -hmm. and are not sitting. So. I am applaud all efforts to liberate people. It is actually a tangible way to liberate people is to be a part of the Freedom Fund, the Mama's Bailout, please do it. It's like literally being your own Harriet Tubman. Like, let's just go out there and do it. Yeah, let's just free them, free them all. <laughs> um, and at Moms Rising, we've worked with the Texas Jail Project around um, bailing out pregnant women who, if they had the bail money, they'd be home. Yeah. They had, like what many of us had in the room, they'd be home waiting trial to like, get whatever or get uh, found innocent or pay whatever fine, but because they don't have it, they may give birth in, in jail, which we know involves shackling, which we know involves being um, isolated, put in solitary confinement, which happens a lot in Texas, um, which can uh, harm mother and child. Mm -hmm. And I want to end with the fact that, um, and, and then open it up, that the United States right now has the highest maternal mortality rate, that is women dying while giving birth, during labor and giving birth, than any other developed nation in the entire world. And that, that, that stat, that, that, um, that branding is driven by the fact that black mothers are four times more likely to die during childbirth than their white counterparts. And if you drill down in certain counties, the rate is up to 12 times as much. So there are so many ways that the child welfare system and the criminal justice system interact, and as we also have heard touched on, the healthcare delivery system. They all converge to create a very toxic and deadly um, environment for black and brown mamas. So we want to bring the audience in. Hi, I wanted to um, add some pieces of information from research that I did comparing addiction treatment programs for um, women in the healthcare system and in the criminal justice system. and. I found that child protective services pushed women into both programs, but by associate, but the criminal justice program um, then associated women coming through CPS with um, criminal stigma, and the programs were much more punitive. The definition of addiction that they used in, conveyed all this racial stigma, um, and it caught them up in the criminal justice system in various ways. So. My sense was that addiction as an idea was a way of pushing women from CPS into the criminal justice system. So I'm interested in your experiences with the idea of addiction and how that's playing out in the interlocking between these systems. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can do one. I think a lot of times it is an addiction. It's use. It's a positive drug tox that the woman didn't even know she was being subjected to. Um, often we've seen it stamped on the test result, this is not to be used for forensic purposes, and that's exactly how it's used. They're subjected to drug tests that if, if it was an employer, an employee at the hospital, it would be confirmed, it wouldn't be treated in this way. So I'm also glad that folks have brought up the issue of privacy and medical decision making, because they're not actually. So, so I think one, I, I think we always need to push back on when are we talking about use? When are we talking about use disorder, addiction? Mm -hmm. um, but there's some other pieces here too. Um, also, like I said, to punish, being, using drugs, being addicted to drugs, from, and again, I'm not a lawyer, but being a, dependent on a substance is not a crime. It's, it's not. There's, I can't remember the court case now, but like mm -hmm. it just, a, a rule of law, you, you can't be criminalized for who you are. 
So I, I just take strong issue with even the fact of the pregnant woman being subjected to this in a way that mm -hmm. if, you know, and it's also not just drug cases. It's also women who've attempted suicide, women who've said, I don't want to sign off in advance that I want a C-section. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and again, I'm not, I'm not being like adversarial with what your findings are. I just want to kind of complicate our understanding of what these cases look like or how they come to the attention. Um, so it's a lot of different circumstances where they're not... So that's one piece, but I also think that even, and um, one of the things that happens is we have this mistaken idea, and I think a lot of the social workers, I suspect, in, in some of these cases, really thought they were doing the right thing by notifying CPS. Mm -hmm. Didn't realize that that, in so many cases, is the functional equivalent. You're, it's just a stop on the train to the criminal punishment system. So one of the things that I challenge us to do, and not just social workers, not just nurses, not just doctors, any of us in our wherever we live and work and go to school, I ask myself in another context, I teach at a university, what happens? I'm, I'm a mandated reporter. I'm supposed to report my students who tell me about a sexual assault. And as someone who teaches courses on gender and violence, I hear these cases. What happens if I do report? I need to know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I need to know those consequences. And I can't just take word, oh, oh they're referred to so-and-so. Well, let me call so-and-so. Let me try to drill down on that. So that's one of the things we can challenge ourselves. What are our policies? Do we really understand them? Do we really know the consequences? And I kind of want to give a shout out to Bronx Defenders. Um, could you guys say, speak? Can uh, talk about that yeah, too, could you yeah, speak sure. also to what you do with the medical uh, staff? I think you have folks visiting. Yeah, yeah. we do. We have, we have folks coming, um, interns that are um, going to school um, from Montefiore, I believe. Yeah, so yeah, we, you can speak more on that. Yeah, we host the residents from Jacoby and from Montefiore yeah. that are in the child protection and sorry, in the child advocacy centers as well as the NICU and the pediatric residents. And the purpose is simply exactly what Jean is saying is they believe that they are calling CPS to engage social supports for our clients. That's mm -hmm. their thought process. They're like, oh, okay, well, this is cool. Like, this person tested positive for this substance, even though I did this without their consent or knowing them, and I have this idea that they're gonna need help. Um, and so I'm gonna call this social support system to get help for them. Okay, step number one, they, they didn't ask for help from you. But number two, it's not help. And so what we're doing is that we are trying to bring them into the actual spaces our clients inhabit, which is the courtroom, which is to our office, to see what actually happens after the phone call. CPS is not a provider. CPS is not a health provider. Mm. CPS is not a treatment provider. Right. CPS right. is an investigative unit. They are in contact constantly with police and district attorneys. They are not a social network. They are not a health provider. So if you think you are making a phone call for that reason, you are wrong. Mm -hmm. You're calling CPS is the equivalent of calling the police on someone. I am a youth worker and I work with young women of color. Um, and because of like the nature of my work, I'm always interested in learning more about the ways that these institutions that have a tendency to criminalize young women of color um, can impact you know, the young women of color who are either mothers or pregnant. So I was wondering if you all could speak to the ways that this um, intersects with age. So these like institutions that you're speaking of um, to intersect mm -hmm. with age. I have a, a good story. So I have a client who um, was, she was born in Chicago. In Chicago, her mother had a uh, child protection case where it required her daughter to seek therapy. They diagnosed her daughter at, um, which is my client, at 11 years old with bipolar and required her to be medicated. That diagnosis of having bipolar disorder and needing medication, and I'm talking about really heavy medication, she had lithium at 12 and 13, was used as a way to monitor my client's mother. My client lives through the system, and in, as a child in the system, they keep records, because any time that you are in contact with the system, any contact that CPS or a social worker or a foster care agency has with your family, they have to type up every single note. So from the age of 12, her entire youth was entered into a database system. At 18, she got pregnant. 
at around 18 and a half, her mother died. She moved to New York. She had her baby in New York City. Her mother was dead. Her mother had previously had her on her uh, benefits account. So our client, who was newly pregnant, was unable to get benefits because she didn't have the death certificate from Chicago to give to public benefits here. So what did she do? She thought, sought the assistance of this entity that she felt was helpful as a child in New York to help get um, access to prenatal care, access to uh, diapers, to uh, formula because she wasn't able to get cash assistance for her benefits. She seeks out social services. Seems like something she would want to do as a healthy person, right? Like she's trying to reach out to get support networks. As soon as she reaches out, her entire youth status becomes a part of the database again. So they're reading her history. She has a child. They say, well, you have a mental health diagnosis and you're untreated and you're not taking medication. She says, I have a mental health diagnosis? It's from when she was 12. So she's in a relationship with someone and it ends up becoming not a healthy relationship. She tells her worker. They come and the worker says, okay, you need to leave this person. There's no other option. You have to leave this person or we will take your baby. So she does. She continues to ask them for help with diapers, with milk, those of that nature. About four months later, she is in the shelter system because her stepfather, who's in New York, is unable to take, take her because he has contacts with criminal justice system from the past. The prior arrest makes him not a suitable person for her to live with, so she has to go into the shelter system. She goes into the shelter system where they then place a call in thinking that they're being helpful, and now everyone has this integrated team and this worker that was working with her starts to talk about her history as a 12-year-old and her mental health diagnosis and her history from Chicago. And they say she can't have any visitors. She can't have any boyfriends, no one in her shelter. She's 19 years old at this point. If she wants to have sex, that makes sense. She has, doesn't want to live her life without being able to do that. Has someone over. They come in the dead of night and remove her six-month-old. They file a petition against her, and what is the charges of neglect in that case? She has an untreated mental health diagnosis. They don't put the age of when she was diagnosed. That she is in a relationship that involves domestic violence, and she is quote unquote engaging in domestic violence. That she is unstable and has unstable housing and is homeless and that she does not have adequate financial resources and they go to list every single time she's ever asked for help. Every single time they've asked for diapers, for formula, and those are the allegations. Then they literally, we go in, we get the baby back, and then they proceed to file on her every single day for an entire week to try to get that baby removed all started when she was 12 years old. She still has to go to mental health treatment based on a 12 year, her diagnosis as a 12 year old to this day. And she does not have bipolar disorder. She's in talk therapy for adjustment disorder because her Medicaid refuses, the person she goes to is billing through Medicaid and they're saying, well, since she's mandated by a court, the only thing I can do is give her the baseline disorder, which is adjustment disorder, otherwise I don't get paid for seeing her and she's mandated to come see me. So that's how it impacts. Once they're in the system, they're in the system. You're tracked all the way through. Many, many users told that this will be not be looked at, that it, it's a sealed record, it's confidential. It's not confidential to Child Protective Services. It's not confidential to the judges that oversee these cases. They're tracked all the way through. Thank you. Thank you all for um, holding this panel. I came on a train from, at 3 a.m. this morning from D.C. because I felt like this was so important. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> I'm a little bit tired. Um, so, um, one of the themes that was brought up was surveillance, and so I'm curious if you all could talk a little bit more about how that works with CPS, um, the surveillance, and then also, um, much like how 
the criminal punishment system is sort of like mutating and um, we're being offered these reforms that are actually just like moving it from these centers into our actual communities and homes, so like electronic monitoring and things like that. Are there any um, reforms that are being peddled for this, for this issue that we should actually be pushing back on because it's just moving it from one place to another? So I'll talk about the um, CPS surveillance. Um, and basically that starts when the phone call is made and that investigation is um, called in. Because um, what happens is that once that call is made to Albany, there's a 60-day investigation. And I, I do air quotes because it's normally way longer than 60 days. And so ACS will say that they have to go and visit the client and they have to go check in their home. So imagine somebody coming to your door at 3 a.m. and telling you to wake up your kids because they need to check their bodies, wake them up out of bed, out of their sleep, strip your kids so they can check their bodies. They're gonna go into your cupboards, they're gonna go into your rooms, they're gonna go into your bathroom, they're gonna make sure that you have food in your fridge. And this is done every week uh, for the life of the investigation. Now. Imagine that then they take you to court and now the judge is ordering court-ordered supervision, right? Mm -hmm. That's ACS coming to your home for however long they decide or however long the life of the case is until the case is resolved. I've had clients come to me and say, my ACS worker is following me. There's been cases where there's quote unquote DV, right? And so they wanna follow our clients to make sure that they're not engaging with the partner. And so they will sit there and park. I've had caseworkers call me and say, hey, I was parked in front of your client's house and I seen them come out with her boyfriend. And doesn't she say that he beats her? Well, you know what? She's engaging in domestic violence. Like there's so many different avenues of surveillance. It doesn't have to be court ordered. The minute that that phone call is made and ACS starts an investigation, the surveillance starts. It could be phone calls and Every single time they come into your client's space, they are threatening them with the removal of their child. So it's not like, hey, I'm here and I just want to make sure that everything is fine. It's, mm -hmm. you know that I can take you to court and I can take mm -hmm. your child. That's how they um, speak with our clients. I mean, it's never, a, I mean, I've had clients go into ACS looking for help and not having any issues except for they have a teenager that possibly is just being a pain in the ass, right? And what happens, ACS does not know how to help them without having a judge order them. So then they go and file in court so they can have court ordered supervision so they can help the client with the child that has, that's just going through teenage years. Mm. So there are so many different avenues, but I, I just want you to leave from here knowing that the minute that that call is made, the surveillance starts. I just want a couple. What are some of the reforms we should watch out for? Yeah, go sorry. ahead, you can continue I'll do some reforms too. Um, okay. A couple little things I would add to that is also they're coming to court because they lack respect of agency of black women. They, lack, they do not give us any regard when we say, that's not something I feel like I need. They say, oh, you don't think you need it? I'm going to a court. Or you don't think you need it? I'm, gonna, I'm threatening to remove your child. Mm -hmm. And so when you're thinking about what's happening to women and bring it back to centering black women is that if we choose to have children, that is a different threat to our liberty. It's one thing to say, okay, I'm going to attack you and, and me and my body. It's another thing to say, I will also then remove your child. Mm -hmm. That type of quote unquote love test, that type of bartering your own child, it's, it's, a, it's another form of slavery, right? Like they're sitting mm -hmm. there saying that in exchange, for your child, you have to do X, Y, Z. If you do not submit to this service, I will take your child and put them into a government system where they will be tracked, where they will be financed, where they have a higher outcome, a higher probability of going into the prison system, of being raped, of having all of these outcomes that are not child welfare outcomes. Mm -hmm. So that's another way there's a surveillance, right? It's not just, oh, okay, well, you're coming, to, you're coming to court, I'm trying to help you, but it's I'm gonna force and put my own agenda onto what's happening. So reform efforts, I think one thing that we can challenge, um, there's, uh, child welfare is interesting because it's state law and federal law that has an interaction with each other, right? So what are some federal laws that we can look at? CAPTA, Child Abuse and Prevention and Treatment Act. So that is what, has a lot of definition of what mandated reporting is. And there is 
conversation and legislation about universal drug testing, universal urine testing. Mm. No, say no to it. Yeah. <laughs> Number, and the reason why is it sounds like this great thing, like, oh, we're just gonna drug test people and like to see what happens. You have to understand for women, and this is what is, I, I challenge people to really sit with, we are judged differently when we are pregnant. Mm -hmm. So what, ha what is when you're not pregnant and you are drug tested, you are demonized if you come back with any type of toxicology. But imagine when you are pregnant. And as a woman, you don't stop being a woman because you are pregnant. You don't stop being a person because you are pregnant, but you have a different treatment. Mm -hmm. And if we are truly interested in being feminist and really looking at reproductive choice and reproductive justice, we need to support women when they are pregnant. We need to support women when they use when they are pregnant. We need to not threaten them. Mm -hmm. We need to not then put them under a different category of mandated reporting and testing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that puts them in funnels them in a system. And I challenge people to really have those conversations with people because they're tricky. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Also, the reforms outside the system. So anything that's advocating for better health care, housing, to me, that, that's also part and partial of what undergirds this. So I've been trying to challenge myself to think not just reforms within these systems, but what are the supports people need to make it harder for them? You know, to, to put food in the fridge, because a lot of these cases mm -hmm. are about poverty they're right. not about yeah. well can I just add one more thing is that we also need to remember that when we're talking about child welfare and child welfare enforcement people tend to think that it's because like somebody's being monstrous and you know and brut and violently brutalizing their child and this is not what we're talking about you know in many of these cases you know it is the food in the fridge it is the being black it is using a substance and it's particular substances, you know, like um, like if you smoke cigarettes and you are white and you are pregnant, you probably are not going to have a child welfare case opened on you, you know, even though cigarettes are actually really bad for you when you, and your fetus when you are pregnant. So like keeping in mind too that we're not talking about um, about like the most horrific thing anybody can ever think of when they're thinking about child welfare and pushing back on that in these conversations as well. Mm -hmm. I, I wanna add one too, this reform of like making the police into social workers kind mm -hmm. of. Mm -hmm. Like everyone thinks, oh, better training, you know, if they, if they interact with a, a, a pregnant mom or someone who's dealing with the economic situation or someone who's dealing with a mental health, health situation, instead of what we want is like, Police don't need to be involved in any of that. It's like, we'll train the police on how to do that. Mm -hmm. That is very deadly and dangerous. I just want to throw that out because you hear a lot of cities talking about expanding these mm -hmm. first responders to be able to like do everything. No. Cat up a tree, you have mental health issues. It's like, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now you're just trying to have somebody keep a job. Like, yes. let's get someone who's an expert on, on those issues. Yeah. My question is about how, you know, for all the work that you all are doing to make people aware that this is happening. I mean, Aaron, you said, a, point A, we want people to understand what, mm -hmm. how these systems interact. One, are there any examples or cases of women who were surveilled, like the Tennessee case, Vicki, um, for years, who then subsequently, backward looking, brought an action against the state or challenged mm -hmm. it that way? Any class actions, any reparations talk, any things like that, number one. And then the second is, um, in thinking about, you know, you're able to identify very clearly, okay, arrest leads to child welfare involvement, like we see that as a as a incident, we can track that. Is there any conversation, or do any of you do any work tracking the more subtle ways that this operates in criminal court? And I'm thinking about just the way courts and prosecutors view women, women of color, standing in front of them and sort of layer on these uh, the scrutiny of motherhood, even when it's not part of the case at all. So a woman is arrested for hopping the turnstile or for taking something from Dwayne Reed, but the way a judge views her layers in all these sort of notions of motherhood and what is a good mother, a bad mother, and the arbitrariness then that that can cause in terms of bail, decision making, like the sort of arbitrary, is anyone looking at the more subtle ways that this can rear its ugly head in criminal court proceedings? And if not, can we all in this room do that next? Mm -hmm. Maybe I think for the second, I think for the already. second one, we are doing it. And I hope that we, uh, you know, all take time to get each other's information. 
but for the first question, do, do you know of any women who filed a suit or if there's any a class action litigation on child welfare from a group of mothers who've experienced the same thing? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. In South Carolina in the 1980s, and I wish we could kind of like make Dorothy Roberts come back, yeah. um, <laughs> because she's written about this, um, uh, poor women who went to whatever the public hospital was Ferguson in South Carolina. Is, yes, Medical University um, of South Carolina. were um, drug tested, and then they were. Um, and these were all black moms, except for one white woman whose partner was black. Um, like they all got drug tested. They all had their. Um, they all had um, child welfare cases open. They were all arrested for whatever the like law was, where you can't be like you know using while pregnant, um, and they filed. A case, and they they got that practice stopped. It went all the way to the U.S. Yes. Supreme Court. Yes, and it was decided on privacy grounds, which was mm -hmm. right. yes. But then, more recently, there was the case of um, the, there was a case. There were a couple of cases in Wisconsin. One of which, um, in which women were went to their they were uninsured or they were underinsured. They went to the public clinic in Wisconsin, and they were like you know either. You know, I am using, and I stopped because I was, one woman was using Suboxone. Um, she stopped when she thought she was pregnant. She disclosed this to medical staff. Medical staff was like, no, 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 you need to go back on Suboxone. She was like, I don't want to. They had her arrested. Um, she, was, she was like forced to go back on Suboxone. There was, an, um, there was another woman who had been using meth and pot before she was pregnant. She disclosed that, you know, to the medical staff, like, yeah, I used to, you know, I used these recently. I think I'm pregnant. I stopped. They found, they did a test. They found out that, yes, indeed, she was pregnant. Yes, she had been using recently. Um, and they arrested her. They forced her into drug treatment. Um, this is under the Wisconsin cocaine mom law. And that was litigated by one of these moms, and I forget which one. Tammy Leacher. Tammy Leacher, and she won, and then the Supreme Court actually said that Wisconsin could continue doing this pending their appeal. So, so, the, um, so that went up to the Supreme Court because the state was appealing and saying, like, yes, we want to keep locking up pregnant moms for using mm -hmm. or not using or deciding what to do with their bodies during pregnancy. And the Supreme Court said, Yes, you can continue using this law as this makes its way through the court system. But also, we just had oral arguments in them last week. So the, the, I'm so glad you're raising mm -hmm. these cases. So these are, um, among others, but national advocates for pregnant women are involved in these mm -hmm. cases. Yes. So there's a documentary called The Case of Alicia Beltran, B-E-L-T-R-A-N, which lays mm -hmm. out this law and the women caught up in it. And then Tammy Leitcher is very much, we're still fighting that case, so let's not, you know, but, yeah. but, but you can pay attention to the coverage that's mm -hmm. coming out of uh, Wisconsin, some of the really good reporting that is being done by mm -hmm. Rewire. So that would be another place to, to kind of get the background on some of these cases. And shout out to Rewire. They're doing excellent yes. coverage yes. on this as well. I just have one. I'll let you do, and then I'm going to do the three. Like there's, like there's one, two, and three. I'm going to let them give their comments, and then we wrap it up like that. But go ahead. I just want to add one thing. One thing that's really important to understand about these legal cases is that a lot of times they turn on whether or not there's criminal prosecution or that people are incarcerated as a result or these tests are being given for purposes of prosecution. And then there's a different set line of cases where we're unsuccessful when it's these tests and these invasions are given to CPS workers because the law seems to contemplate that CPS is not a policing force. So one of my big charges to everyone is to really push people to, to tell people that CPS is a police force, that this is what happens to women. It doesn't just have to be incarceration, that being tracked in these systems are just as violent, just as evil, just as racist, just as punitive, and they lead families and children to be in prison systems because we do not have success when there isn't um, the explicit collaboration between CPS and law enforcement when it comes to legal cases. I, I have an experience. Special needs doesn't seem to um, care. Prior to an hour ago, I would have said that I am interested in being a foster parent with the intention <laughs> to adopt a child. Um, so going back on that, is there any way to have an abolitionist approach to the child welfare system and continue a pursuit um, with the intent to collaborate perhaps with birth families or is there an avenue or 
aspects of the organizations you're talking about that work with foster families to educate on whose children they have and why and what part, how they can not contribute to the problem but still help children? Excellent question. We're going to go around and we're going to get to it, but we're going to go back here, right? Hand up and then here. We'll get these last three so that we can end on time, but that's an excellent, they're all excellent questions, but I'm glad I was at this with the boss. Hi. Um, I'm actually here. I found this conference on Facebook. It just popped up on, on my newsfeed, and I'm so happy um, to be here. I'm a doctoral student of nursing practice, taking public policy. So I've been going around, you know, uh, to different lectures. And this one is really eye opening for me because I work at a hospital in a community of different socioeconomic status. I don't like saying lower, different. And um, predominantly black women. I'm a certified nurse midwife, and I'm working as a nursing executive at this particular hospital. And I've seen some of everything, including women testing positive for marijuana and being told that they can't breastfeed. Mm -hmm. And then we have to get a social work consult, and then you know maybe CPS, and maybe CPS might cover under you know uncover something that she didn't want them to necessarily know that's really not relevant mm -hmm. to her ability to take care of her baby. You know, we're in a food desert, we're in a medically underserved community, um, you name it, inadequate housing, inadequate education. Mm -hmm. But as a healthcare executive, I'm trying to understand, and um, as a future leader, and, and being in a, working in a hospital that's becoming part of a bigger hospital system, I really feel like it's our responsibility to shape public policy, because it's not enough for me to look at my patient and say, you really need to eat healthier, knowing that she has no way to shop for those groceries. Or, um, I'm sorry, I took some notes because my head was all over the place listening. Um, or, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I mean, there's so much it. more that I wanna say. You know, as a black single mother, I take great offense to the fact that I can't yell at my kid in public when she's being Girl. defiant mm -hmm. because I might get followed. Or, you know, listening to police reports about or listening to the news when they discussed a woman who had a joint in her car, like, so what? And then she was forced into having sex with police officers. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, when does it end? Yeah. Right. But just to reel it back, my, my question was, it's just so overwhelming. You know, as a healthcare professional, how can I or how can the healthcare industry help shape public policy so that we can better serve our patients and not be Thank you. part and of you're, the problem. You're here in New York City? I am in Brooklyn. Okay. And I have lots of business cards, so. <laughs> <laughs> I have a good resource for you. Let's take this third one and then we'll let our um, panelists attack uh, each of the three. Hi, uh, this is a bit slightly off topic but still very relevant to the conversation. Um, I just wanted to bring up this very huge irony of how uh, black and brown motherhood is so dehumanized and demonized. And yet, in the nanny and uh, domestic care industry, you see so much of these uh, black and brown women who are taking care of usually white affluent kids. And I actually uh, read a book <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and I, um, I actually uh, read this book called uh, Racing Brooklyn by uh, Tamara R. Moore a couple months ago. And she even highlighted that even though um, there's such a high representative of black and brown and nannies and domestic care workers, there are also surveillance as well in like p public places and um, parks and whatnot by uh, other like other people in the area, usually in the um, white affluent areas of uh, New York. So I, I just want you all to speak to this whole contradiction of even though black and brown motherhood is, is demonized, there's such an overrepresentation of them being domestic care workers and nannies and whatnot. Mm, yeah, got a good answer for that one. Okay, so let's start with the foster care parents. It's, I know you work with a, a parent advocate for the, the parent, the biological parent. Is there anything, are there any programs, are there any campaigns to educate the fostering parents about um, 
Well, usually this we, pipeline. Don't, we don't offer that at our office. We specifically target our community and we only represent parents. Mm -hmm. um, and foster parents, usually they, they have an agency that they work for, a specific agency. And so whatever trainings or workshop, workshops they get, they get through their own individual agencies. Um, I'm not very well versed on what happens with foster parents except for the fact that they get a lot of money to take care of my client's kids when my client could be getting that money to take care of their own kids. So I guess I wouldn't be the correct person to ask mm -hmm. this question. <laughs> <laughs> I and I think that, um, no, I was going to say, I think this is where ideas are born, right? Mm -hmm. We're here, we're in this space. I mean, I was just, I'm like, foster parents for the abolition of the child welfare system. I feel like that might be your jam. You know what I'm saying? Um, because we need to come at this from all angles, and yeah. it's true. It is not the role of the, the parents who are trying to keep their kids mm -hmm. and those working with them and defending them to determine what that is. But clearly, we're gonna have foster parents. We're gonna have mm -hmm. foster families. I mean, hell, if they, if they end TPS, Temporary Protective Services, for the tens of thousands of people here from Haiti and other places, they're saying the estimate is 273,000 children will be separated from their parents. So this is just like outside of the criminal justice, although immigration and criminal justice, mm -hmm. and that's another, that's another <laughs> panel. But clearly there's going to be fostering that's happening and we need people to take in the abolition uh, values on that side. So well, there's did you also, touch it? Oh, yeah. In Washington state a few years ago, um, there was a, a law passed called the Children of Incarcerated Parents Act or bill, um, which basically slows down the timeline for the Adoption and Safe Families Act, which states that if a child has been in foster care for 15 of the past 22 months, um, social workers in the state have to start proceedings to terminate parental rights. Mm -hmm. And the Children of Incarcerated Parents Bill, which is modeled on the New York State ASFA Expanded Discretion Act, slows down that timeline if a parent, if a parent is incarcerated and that's why their child is in foster care. And one of the things that um, some foster parents did in Washington state was they got up and they testified in favor of this law. They said, we are here as like, you know, sort of like caregivers for kids until their parents come out of jail or prison. We understand that like this is our role is we provide a safe home because that parent is locked up right now and you know, like, and they can know that their child is here, but we don't want them to lose their parental rights because they're locked up for 18 months awaiting trial. We don't want them to lose their rights because they're locked up for three years on a plea deal. We don't want, you know, we, the, we understand that right. Whatever the criminal legal system did, it should not include permanently losing your child. So they got up and they testified for this. So I think part of this too is saying like, what are these bills that I can plug into and say, as a foster parent, I understand this, mm -hmm. you know, and not just leave it up to the biological parents and the advocates that work with biological parents, but also to say, yes, you know, I work, um, I house children yep. and I care for these children and they want to see their parents. And just because you are locked up does not mean that you are a bad parent. Yeah, and infiltrate these still spaces with this information. On the one about what um, uh, our esteemed nurse who's working in Brooklyn talking about the social determinants of health and you basically can tell someone all day, oh, you should, you should, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, mm -hmm. right? But that's not really how our day is structured. We think we're making choices that we're not, right? So there, there are things that exist in our environment that lead us to certain types of food, that leads us to certain types of house, housing, that keeps us from certain types of food. And so the New York City Department of Health Equity, which is run by um, Dr. Aletha Maybank, uh, and I don't know if you know her, but definitely get it. She's trying to really reach out to uh, hospitals, organizing doctors and nurses to understand what health equity is and understand the social determinants of health and explain to doctors and nurses and healthcare providers that if we wanna make our patients healthy, then we actually have to attack racism. Mm -hmm. We actually have to attack sexism, and she's really bold in that. So I think she's a tremendous resource and that she'll even come to, to your facility to talk to folks there. And um, you can also, touch on that Also, healthy food is expensive. Yes, yeah, yeah. she'll, she'll, she'll break it down. She'll say, stop telling people, oh, you need to eat this, that, and other, and they live in a food desert. Like, the doctors mm -hmm. need to get out there and, you know, <laughs> abolish the damn food desert, right? Mm -hmm. If they want their um, patients not to have type 2 diabetes. So it's just really good. 
Did you want to say I'm something just on that very one? Very we'll do the last um, one. In terms of, um, okay. uh, yeah, the, one, the other literature that, it, so one, the New York City Department of Health is oddly good in some places. I mean, the, the director is, the no, 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 I mean, but the commissioner yeah, has, Mary, some, has, Mary Bassett, yeah, has some good stuff to say, so I don't. started this Department yeah. of Health Equity. Yes, yeah, I was wondering if that was one of the, yeah. Um, but the other literature I'd point you to is that we hear sometimes about cultural competency, but there's also in the public health literature one of structural competency, and that kind of speaks to this issue that, that you're talking about. So I found it helpful once I stumbled across that term, it led me to some other, to some good critiques and strategies and approaches and maybe would allow you. And then I just wanted, this kind of bridges these two, um, and I would just direct you to the words of Jenny Joseph. She's um, a midwife who uh, uh, practices in Florida, and she, she's very powerful in saying, you know, you don't have to have cultural competency training. You just have to listen and believe what the patients are telling you, period. You don't have to speak a specific language to be kind. You just have to think a little bit, bit and put yourself in that person's shoes. You have to understand she might be in fear for her baby's health or her own health. You can smile. You can touch respectfully. You can make eye contact. You can find a real translator. You can do these things if you choose to, or you can stay in place in a system you know is broken, doing business as usual, and continue to feel bad doing the work you once loved. So those are not my words, those are Jenny Joseph, but I think they're, I find them helpful in a lot of circumstance of how we can interact with vulnerable human beings in a very vulnerable moment. Yeah, a and constant theme, humanizing, you know, making sure you can see yourself uh, in the person that, you know, ultimately it's a partnership too. Uh, you know, we say providers, but it's really a partnership, right? The person knows themselves as well. Um, on the last comment about, which I love, um, about the criminalization of, of black and brown motherhood and yet the hiring of, of black and brown labor to mother, right? Like how, uh, it's, it was so profound because my, my teenager literally came home yesterday from school and was like, you know what, Ma? They love our culture, but they don't love us, mm. you know? <laughs> and, you know, wanting to make sure your, your child learns another language from this mm -hmm. brown woman or, you know, the culture and the beauty and, the, and all of these great things. But then, you know, we, we, do you protect that person? Do you see that person as a full human being? That is a long, you know, history. And you can point out analogies like that throughout the existence of black women in the United States, like mm -hmm. since the beginning, right? Whether it's the culinary stuff, like anything it is, any, any, any and everything. You know, there's this um, obsession, uh, exalting of the, the culture and everything, but the person, you know, is totally criminalized, is totally dehumanized. And so it's just really consistent with what we've seen. But it made me think of that, that saying that's very popular right now. And it's just so clear that you can actually love, and love is a loose term in that, in that mm -hmm. sense, but you can appreciate and want more of all of the things that that person has to bring to a society and yet want to erase them from the society at the same time. Yeah, I mean, look, that's what a mammy, that's what a Jezebel is. Like, they've been doing that for forever and that's the reality. Like, we have to come from the very beginning and understand that being a black mother is one of the most cherished spaces. Like, we've been raising white children since we, they brought us over here. Our vaginas, our uteruses have been places of commodification. Like we were brought here to produce money from our vaginas since we were got here. It's not crazy that it's still happening through the foster care system, right? Like we birth something that then becomes a, a thing that makes people have jobs. Like I, like I birthed black children that could be the source of a CPS worker's job. That is a source of a prison system. Like that's not new. And so we need to come together and really fight that. When it comes to what you're saying about being a foster parent, you can do it. Guess what? Foster care agencies are some of the most, the agencies are run by a ton of white supremacy, uh, white supremacist ideals. And you need to understand that when you go into that space, every bit of literature is not touched by the community that it describes. My clients don't have an opportunity to write their own stories, to tell what happened in their own families. It is about seven different people who have told you what's happened to that child that is not their mother. They will tell you not to talk to that mother. They will tell you not to talk to that mother's lawyer. They will tell you not to reach out to them. People, foster parents would go in and say, I want to adopt. Imagine how threatening that is. You're coming in, the law says for at least 15 months the goal has to be to return that child and I'm meeting you and you're saying that you want to take my child? 
that you're coming here to adopt kids, to make me a legal stranger to my child, and I'm supposed to work with you? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm sorry, and excuse my language, but get the fuck out of here. If that's what you're coming with my kids, and you're coming at me with my children like that, and you need to under, and I think we need to understand that that's what is the role that's happening. And so it doesn't mean there's not a place, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean there's not a, t a, a, a place that that's happening. Like, look, we're not gonna abolish the system tomorrow. But if you know that that's the role that you're feeling in this black woman's life, and you honor that experience that they're going through, that you might kill them to their child, then you will understand them more. Mm -hmm. You will get their family more, and you will get that child more. And you will do everything you can to try to preserve that. Because without our families, without our connections to who we are, we will not be able to move forward. A round of applause for our panel. Also keep it going for Andrea Ritchie and her work. Another round of applause for the book that has brought us here, the research. Thank you guys for coming out.